good. I'm glad. I'm glad this attempt worked out. I wasn't sure how it would go. That's good. And here they come. <laughs> Do you want me to put my slide, the slide you sent me, Steve, up? Sure. If you want to send pop, pop that up, that'd be fine. Start sharing. Yeah, go ahead. And this way we can double check that you're all good to go too. Hold on, I just got to. Okay. Yep. So the difference between the two I sent you, Dave, was one was the long wide version and one was the, sh the shorter version. Uh, okay. <laughs> that explains the slight difference. Yeah, I couldn't tell the difference either. Steve had to explain it to me. Well, mine's the sh not the wide version because it's older slides, not a brand new. It looks like it's working on our end, Dave. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure it was advancing. So welcome to everyone who's joining us this evening uh, for the Weathering the Storm webinar series. Um, we are gonna get started in just a couple of minutes. We just opened up the webinar and we're just waiting for everybody to join us. So well, we will get started in just a couple of minutes. Sorry, Dave, I have to jump into MC mode every, <laughs> every couple of seconds. Steve, do you want me to handle Q and A? Sure. And that's where we'll have people mostly pop in their questions, correct? Yeah. I'm gonna let you control. You moved it, didn't you? I didn't. The slides? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't believe I did. Huh. That's interesting. Because I didn't hit, I didn't advance it. Hmm. Had a <laughs> mind of its own. You might have it on a timer. <laughs> Thank you again to everybody who joined us tonight who's joining us tonight for the Weather in the Storm webinar series. We will get started in just a moment. Um, just giving everybody a chance to jump in. I know I got hit with the dreaded Zoom update before, so hopefully, you know, that might be in the delay of, of some of the folks joining us. Um, but we will get started in just a moment uh, with our first speaker of the series, Dr. David Robinson, who I will do a brief introduction and some housekeeping details for you guys, and then we'll get going.
<clears throat> someone just put in the Q&A that there's no audio. We're just not talking. We're just very quiet right now. <laughs> so hopefully you can hear us now. Uh, all right. We waited a couple of minutes, Dave. Are you set to go? Already. Okay. <laughs> um, we are recording this evening's um, webinar. Um, we will be doing that for the series, you know, obviously with the um, consent of the, the speakers, um, and we will make them available to people afterwards um, who have registered for this. So if you are um, uh, wishing to see every one of these, but you're unable to make one of the Monday evenings, just please feel free, free to register, and then we'll have your information and we'll put it out to the registry, uh, people who registered um, after the, 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 the webinars uh, take place. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us um this evening um for our weathering the storm webinar series which is about increased resiliency a decade after superstorm sandy um a lot of us are just in disbelief that superstorm sandy was 10 years ago um, but we wanted to mark the occasion with both the earth day every day uh webinar program and the marine extension program seminar series and kind of mash them up um and do this combined effort to mark this 10 10th anniversary of sandy um, and talk about what lessons has New Jersey and other parts of the, the Mid-Atlantic region um, learned from that um, major storm that came through. And we are very lucky this evening to have our, our kickoff speaker uh, be Dr. David Robinson, who is a distinguished professor of geography, um, who has done climate research for Let's just say a long time. I don't want to age him, but he has done it for a long time. But he is actually um, the state's uh, climatologist as well. Um, and as he was telling us before the start of this webinar, he might be the longest serving state climatologist at this point. Um, so we are very lucky to have him this evening. Um, Dave, could, if you could just advance the slides for me, please. Um, we are doing these webinars, but we are also going to get your feedback at the end of this webinar. At the end, we will put up a poll as we're answering some questions from Dr. Robinson, um, asking you to participate in evaluating this uh, webinar, also talking about some of the things you may have learned uh, this evening, but also talk about some of the actions that you might do at home to help prevent um, or protect yourselves from any sort of extreme weather events. Um, so this slide is just basically outlining that this is part of a research study that we're doing and, and possibly a follow up survey later on, but kind of giving the consent. Um, once again, we are recording these uh, webinars. So if you need to see this information again, feel free to, to go back and check out the recording. But Amy Rowe, who is here with me this evening, um, is a contact information for that. <clears throat> but we also put in the poll um, a question asking for your consent to participate in that poll that, and survey at the end. So once you click yes, you can fill out the poll and you'll be all good. Just a few questions, only 10 in general, and one of them being, do you consent to be in this survey as well? Um, so we are doing this as part of an effort to learn um, how effective our, our, our teaching methods are and our webinars have been. If you could advance one more time for me, Dave. Um, and since we're an educational institution, we are open to everybody, um, regardless of, of race, uh, sexual orientation, creed, ability, or, or disability. Um, and we do our best to kind of make these webinars and our educational programs available to all. So this is just a slide mentioning that we strive to do our best to enable um, as many people as possible to, to participate in our programs. Um, but if you have any questions or, or have any concerns or could uh, provide information on how to increase that accessibility. This is the information for that, but we do our best to ensure that as many people can participate as possible. And I can see that we have over 110 people who are joining us this evening. So thank you all for being here. Um, you can go to your first slide, Dave. Um, this evening, as I said, we are very fortunate to have um, as our kickoff speaker for the Weathering the Storm series, uh, be Dr. Dave Robinson. As I mentioned, he is a distinguished professor in the Department of Geography. Um, he is also the state climatologist for New Jersey. He is also involved in extension to the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. And he has been involved in climate research and um, making the public aware of climate issues for um, a very long time. And we are so pleased to have him uh, be here this evening. Um, if you guys have any questions for, for Dr. Robinson, we are gonna save them towards the end of the talk, but please put them in the Q&A. There should be a little button at the bottom um, that says Q&A, click on that and you can put in your question. Please put it to the panelists so that myself and, and Amy Rowe, who's assisting me tonight, can, can get that to you guys. And then we can feed them up to, to Dr. Robinson. Um, but Dave, thank you again for, for doing this for us this evening. And we are so excited to have you be our kickoff speaker to talk about some of the extreme weather events that we've seen 
and what possibly people can do about it. So the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much. All right, terrific. Thank you, uh, Steve and Amy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I love to attend the seminars, the Monday seminars, and done it on multiple occasions. And, and it's a real treat to be able to contribute to this one, to kick off, uh, as Steve said, hard to believe, but 10 years uh, since Sandy, uh, a tremendously transformative event in so, so many ways uh, in New Jersey uh, and the Mid-Atlantic. And um, I hope to bring you back down memory lane on storms in general. Um, we're going to touch on Ida as well, the, the most noteworthy storm since Sandy, which just a couple of weeks ago is the first anniversary uh, of Ida. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what the future may hold in terms of storms. So a lot of slides to get through. And knowing that this is recorded um, is great because I can quickly zip through a few slides and whet your appetite to maybe to go back and, and look at those slides at, at a later time. So anyway, moving forward, uh, you're looking at a house up in Raritan Bay there that was just pulverized uh, during Sandy, record high uh, sea level, record high storm surge uh, in Raritan Bay and along the North Jersey coast and into our estuaries to the north in New York Harbor and up into the Meadowlands. Um, this is an overview of where we're going to go in the next 45 minutes and to an hour. I'll stick around and answer all the questions you might have, but I don't want to keep you here all evening. Um, but start off, as you can see, I'm going to return to this every time we switch gears. So you don't have to memorize this right now. Uh, but start off with greetings from the State Climate Office. For those of you who didn't know it existed, uh, we've been at Rutgers um, over at Cook and Sebs um, since the late 1970s when a federal state climate program was abolished in the early 70s. It was ramped up primarily at, um, at land grant institutions and some state um, environmental offices. And we prosper today with state climate offices in every state but Massachusetts right now. And I'd like to think we're one of the more active states, um, small but strong um, in, in the state climate office. Uh, our purpose is to sum it up. We help people make decisions. Um, and that could be the governor. It could be John or Jane Q. Public, any state agency you might think of. Um, private businesses, people from the private sector, from NGOs, we will provide information and expertise on weather and climate to help them make a decision. But we're not going to make a decision for them. Uh, they're better informed, but we work with them and tailor the information on weather and climate to help them make an informed decision. And if you think about it, just about everything out there has some weather and climate aspect to it in the foreground or in the background. So it makes for a very interesting office, uh, wonderful to be able to do the applied uh, the applied science. And we dovetail, we, we partner with regional climate office, offices, national climate offices, national weather service. But our credo is more locals trusting locals because we're here, we have our boots on the ground. We know the climate of our state um, better than anyone else I would contend. Uh, and therefore we do serve a special purpose, but we can't possibly do it all on our own. But I invite you to visit njclimate.org um, to see our website and read monthly narratives of what's going on uh, with the weather and climate, to get past information, uh, to look at climatologies we're building and we'll soon be launching. We've launched one on tornadoes. We're going to launch one on snow, snowfall, um, tropical storms and precipitation, maximum state precipitation events um, from the distant past. And then we operate a weather network, um, which tells us about the present. But the minute we've monitored the present, that becomes part of the climate's logic record. And so the New Jersey, Rutgers, New Jersey Weather Network is a constellation of 67 weather stations. We operate from High Point Monument to West Cape May and all points in between. 
Um, these 67 stations report on a, an every five minute basis and these data are available to the public. They go to the weather service, they go to the office of emergency management, they go to media uh, and, and so on uh, to give a detailed um, view of what's going on a kind of a hyper local view of what's going on with the weather and climate in our state. This shows you the distribution of our stations. I'll just leave it there, except the note that we ramped this up in the late 90s and we've kind of cobbled it together from several networks. Um, we were gathering hourly data, but we were working on getting five minute data reports out there during the summer of 2012. And we were about there. And then we saw Ida on the horizon, Ida, Ida, excuse me, Sandy on the horizon a couple days away. And through the work of folks in the office, we launched five minute data the day before Sandy. It was the first time we had done more than hourly reports. And that five minute data came in handy during Sandy. And it came even became even more valuable in the years past, especially with Ida as it spread its disastrous rains across the state um, just a year ago. So there we are with the weather network. This is what one of our stations looks like out at Rutgers Snyder Farm with a 10 meter tower with an anemometer on the top. We measure many of these variables at some of the, sta uh, at some of the stations, the ones in the top ranking almost at every station. So every station is a little different, solar powered, um, cellular communication. Um, it's, uh, it's the second densest weather network by area in the nation. Delaware beats us out, um, but otherwise we hope being the most densely populated state, we can reach all corners of the state uh, and really keep our finger our pulse of the uh, state's climate. We still could use a few more stations here and there. We're looking to make some upgrades, but there we are. We also, and this I invite you to perhaps join in, I would be su surprised if there aren't several of you listening in who are already Cocoa Raz volunteers. The Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Network is a national program for the last 14 years. It's been in New Jersey. We have about 300 active volunteers, citizen scientists who daily go out and collect data in a standard rain gauge you see there on the left. They go online, they report the data. It goes to a national um, reporting center at Colorado State University and is archived at the National Climate Center. Um, we produce maps. You can get maps off the Kokoraz program. It really helps fill in the gaps of the rain that we don't measure, we can't measure within our 67 station network. So we really have the state covered when it comes to rain, or I might add the lack thereof when we're talking drought. So enough about the state climate office. Let's, let's talk storms um, for the most part. I'm just gonna show you a, a quick suite of storm images, starting off with what are we talking about as impacts of storms? We've got wind, we have rain, we have a storm surge if it's along the coast. The rain can promote freshwater flooding down the rivers. Uh, the surge will be pushing brackish water, salt water up onto the coast, into the estuaries and back bays and up rivers. Um, and the wind you know, depends on the track of the storm. Uh, and the type of wind fields, straight line winds, tropical cyclone winds, gust, uh, gust fronts, um, um, tornadoes, downburst, and so on and so forth. Now notice, I didn't put snow in here. I'm not gonna focus a lot on snow. I've got just one shot on the snow, but those who know me know that's my research area looking at global snow. Um, so sometimes I'm careful not to talk about it too much because you'll never stop me. I start talking snow. Um, but let's look at some of the memorable storms of the past. I don't have any photos of the 1821 hurricane that made landfall in Cape May and essentially came up the present day track of the Garden State Parkway. But that wrecked havoc 
in Philadelphia, in New York. The coast of Jersey wasn't developed hardly at all then, but that was a devastating category two, maybe borderline category three hurricane. Um, that's something I would talk about in past lectures before 2012 and say, the important thing to recognize is it can happen. It has happened. But I don't have to do that much in the last, didn't have to do that much in the last 10 years because I could turn to Sandy in which most people had personal experience. But we had a hurricane in 44 that really racked up, raked up the coast, stayed just offshore six years after the, the major hurricane of 38 ravaged and killed 600 people on Eastern Long Island and Southeastern New England and just was far enough off the coast to cause problems in New Jersey, but not the, the, of the magnitude of 44 hurricane. Then the, the famous nor'easter of 62, which just had its 60th anniversary in March, where a low pressure, a nor'easter stalled off the Jersey coast and high tide after high tide was pushed ashore. It wasn't a major event inland as much as one right along the coast and no place got hit harder than Long Beach Island. Um, then we've had rural and, and, and um, um, city, municipal, higher density areas, flash flooding, oftentimes from isolated rainstorms. Uh, this is one in August 20, 2000 up in Sussex um, and, and um, Morris County, right around Hepatcon in Sparta. That dumped upwards, we don't know officially, but it, some areas were pretty confident 15 inches of rain fell in just six to 12 hours. It was very localized, but it not only flooded some streams and rivers and there were some landslides, but it actually flooded Lake Apatcon. And you can see there, that's not a houseboat. That should be on the shore there in the top left. So that was localized, exceedingly heavy rain. Then along came Floyd. Now we started seeing what became repetitive major flooding events in New Jersey from tropical systems and, and nor'easters that just came in rapid succession over the last couple of decades in New Jersey. And Floyd kind of kicked it off um, just 23 years ago on fr this past Friday, um, really hit the Raritan Basin the hardest. And you can see here um, some shots. The top right, you wouldn't recognize anymore. That, that's the intersection of what was Commercial Avenue and Route 18 before it was redeveloped. But you can recognize the Hyatt and the J&J &J headquarters. And this is the flooding that occurred in Boundbrook, um, just upstream. Um, here's your snow shot, major snowstorm. You may remember if you're from the eastern half of the state, December 26, 2010, the western half didn't get much into the precipitation side of things, got a half foot of snow, windy snow, but the eastern half had upwards of two feet to two and a half feet of snow, again, up the Garden State Parkway, basically. That top shot is a uh, side street in uh, Highland Park, right off campus. Um, then came, just a year later, Irene. Irene we, we, we recognized that the flooding from Floyd in the Raritan Basin hadn't been seen since even back to colonial times. My former colleague in the geography department, Pete Wacker, um, a historic geographer, could not find any evidence of anything approaching that. Yet 12 years later, Irene came along and essentially equaled the flooding um, that came from the heavy rains of Irene and the heavy rains of Floyd. And these are some shots of Manville um, uh, at, near the confluence of the Raritan and the Millstone River, which has just taken repetitive hits. Um, but it's not always storms of rain. Sometimes we have these dry storms, if you will. And I remind you, we can be hit in drought by drought in New Jersey. This is the Delaware River bed in the mid 1960s, the river is just over here on the left. Uh, the drought of the last 500 years probably in the mid Atlantic um, from 63, 64 till about 66. We had especially three years of very low levels of precipitation. Then recently, we haven't had a drought emergency in the state since 2002. 
Um, but we came close in the hottest summer on record, 2010. It was very dry. And then just this past summer, this is on campus, uh, Livingston campus, um, just um, two months, a month and a half ago. That grass has greened up a little with some recent rains, but look at those trees. They, they obviously have not recovered. So we do get these quick hitting flash droughts on occasion ever since we had the last major drought 20 years ago. So little stormy memory lane. Now look, let's look at Sandy. I haven't mentioned that yet, but Sandy was uh, a unique but not unprecedented uh, bird, if you will, of a storm. It was a hybrid storm. It was unique to New Jersey, don't get me wrong there, but it had some of the characteristics of the perfect storm back in, what was that, 91, around Halloween, which the book was written and um, the, the famous fishing vessel was lost. That stayed off the New England and, and um, Canadian maritime coast, never made landfall, but really put a hit on lands to our north and even down to Jersey. This was a similar storm, a former uh, tropical system that was beginning to morph into a mid-latitude cyclone or low pressure system as it approached the Jersey coast and eventually made landfall. So the ingredients here was Sandy, a late season tropical system, hurricane, I, what I would refer to here as a wavy jet stream, quite pronounced sinuosity for that time of the year that lets some really cold air into to the west of us. Um, and there was a blocking high up in the North Atlantic that didn't let the storm head out to sea as storms often do when they get to the middle latitude west to east wind, winds. And of course that trough was very deep and that trough helped to kind of pull the storm towards the coast and the high pressure system with its clockwise flow helped to push it towards the coast, um, simplifying things a bit. Uh, but as I say here, it was a recipe for disaster. Uh, the question, in the days before the storm, when mod forecast models began to pick it up the th Wednesday, Thursday before the storm, which came on the Monday, the 29th of October, was, was it going to really make that left turn going against prevailing wisdom and, and, and head to the coast? And if it did, where? Was it going to be Southern New England, Long Island, New Jersey, or down the Delmarva? And the forecast began to come into a line by Sunday that the storm was likely to make landfall somewhere along the Jersey coast. But the National Hurricane Center thought it was long ago to have lost hurricane characteristics. But they underestimated, I, I believe, the warmth of the sea surface off the East Coast. We had had two consecutive years of above normal temperatures, nothing odd of late frankly. Um, so the storms remained stronger than expected. Um, they should have continued hurricane watches and warnings further north to really get catch people's attention better than just storm force winds and, and a major um, flooding on shore and strong winds, as was predicted. It's not as if the local weather service offices, once they got the handoff from the hurricane center, let their guard down. No, they were incredibly vigilant and very, very strongly worded statements about the danger of this storm. But it actually resulted in a policy change at the National Hurricane Center in which now, even if the storm is looking like it's going to morph into a hybrid or a mid-latitude storm, they will continue to issue watches and warnings as long as that storm has the potential of being hazardous to human safety or infrastructure. So Sandy, one of the long lasting outputs or outcomes, I should say, of the storm is this change in policy at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, the other thing that made it a bad situation was landfall came close to high tide. If it had come six hours earlier, six hours later, the, uh, the water levels would have been several feet lower. It still would have been record storm, uh, water levels at Sandy Hook, for instance, but it would have been much closer to the storms of the past. Um, and it was an astronomical high tide due to the phase of the moon. And of course, if it occurred a century ago, 
sea level was about 15 to 17 inches lower then. And that added foot made the difference between homes being flooded and not, and, and other actions associated with the storm. So a bad situation of this storm was made worse by all of these other kind of worst case scenario ingredients for this storm. Now, mind you also, it was a massive storm. That's the danger of these hybrid systems. And we actually saw it in the Bering Sea just at the end of last week and early this week, a dying typhoon morphed into a hybrid storm and just has pulverized the west coast of Alaska with sea level of nine feet above normal in Nome, Alaska. And what it was was a storm that as it transferred from a typhoon into an extra tropical storm grew in size. So the localized strength diminished, but the overall strength increased and the coverage of that storm increased. And that played a big role along our coast with the storm surge, because it wasn't just this small storm pulling in water from just offshore as it came ashore. It had a long fetch. The winds were blowing from well out in the Atlantic and just pushing that water towards shore. So while we didn't have hurricane force winds on uh, sustained in New Jersey, from this storm. We had a storm surge that was perhaps the equivalent of a category two ballpark, maybe higher um, hurricane because of the size of the storm. Um, this is the path it ultimately took. We'll just leave it at that for now. But again, remember this is a very odd path to make this left turn towards the coast. Um, we saw that 1903 blah, with the vagabond hurricane that came ashore near Atlantic City. Um, as we think are perhaps a hurricane, I'm not so sure it was a hurricane force winds on landfall, but we'll, we'll never know. But suffice it to say, it was took an odd path, as did this storm. This is the cloud mass. You saw that on the intro slide that Steve had up. Uh, the cloud field went from Chicago up to Southern Greenland and down into Georgia and South Carolina um, the morning after um, it made landfall in Jer Jersey. The center was here by that point, but notice the, the immense size of, of the storm. A hurricane would not be nearly that size, but it could do localized, it could do even more damage than this storm. But as we know, this storm did plenty damage over a large area. Um, as I said, it pummeled New Jersey record low pressure. People may not realize it, but over a foot of rain fell down in South Jersey. Um, it was on the left side of the storm, which tends to be the wet side of the storm. The right side of the storm tends to be the windy side of a storm, tropical system here in the mid-Atlantic. And normally you reverse it and the left side of the storm is New Jersey and the right side of the storm is Long Island. If a storm comes right up along the Jersey coast or like Irene, just comes a little bit inland and we get the heavy rain north to south in the state and the, the fish and Long Island, Southern New England get the wind. But with this storm coming in perpendicular to the coast, south part of the state got the rain, the central and north part of the state got the wind and the storm surge. Um, and, and tragically, approximately 40 deaths from a variety of reasons in New, in New Jersey um, add that to additional deaths in, in New York City, um, New York State, uh, and, and a few other spots. Um, minimum pressure, all I want to say about this map was everywhere south of Route 195 broke the state single point record for low pressure. Not just at one point in the state was the record broken from a nor'easter back in 1930, but Two thirds of the state, half to two thirds of the state had the lowest pressure on record in New Jersey, records going back a century or more. Um, wind gusts, 90 miles an hour right along the coast at our seaside heights uh, um, anemometer. Um, winds gusting in the 80s along the coast. Notice inland in central and northern New Jersey gusts up to 60 miles an hour to low 70 mile an hour range. This is at three to 10 meters off the ground. Um, at higher elevations, stronger, hugging the ground, a uh, little bit weaker, but these are very strong winds. A nor'easter often brings us 40, 50 mile an hour winds, maybe a gust over 50. 
wind, the, the power of the wind increases basically exponentially as the speed increases, not linearly. So a 70 mile an hour wind gust is a lot more powerful than a 50 mile an hour wind gust. And we saw that. Meanwhile, in South Jersey, they had the 40 to 50 mile an hour wind gusts. Um, ironically, they had a deratio, an, uh, a uh, squall line, uh, an Uber squall line late June of 2012 that brought them stronger winds than um, Sandy did. But suffice it to say, incredibly strong, unusually strong winds. And total precipitation, some people get Irene and Sandy conflated and think there was a lot of rain and freshwater flooding in northern and central New Jersey. There was not. The flooding was primarily from surge, not from streams and rivers. South Jersey, sandy soils, um, not a lot of major river systems. So they didn't experience the massive flooding we saw with an Irene or a Floyd. Um, so that's the precept. This is Sandy Hook. Uh, this was the tide, the tide gauge there, and it got blown out. It, it got destroyed at about 13.5 feet. Post-storm assessment from U.S. Geological Survey, we helped out some, and um, the National Weather Service kind of looked at the bathtub rings up on Sandy Hook um, and some of the old buildings and military um, uh, um, features, uh, structures, and feel it's it got up to 14.4 feet. The previous record surge, uh, or water level, I should say, at Sandy Hook, was a little over, I think it was 10.2 feet in Hurricane Donna in 1960, September 1960. It was over four feet above the previous record water height. A lot of storms are in the 18 to 20, um, uh, excuse me, the eight to 10 foot range. But this one just is off the charts uh, in terms of the water level along the North Jersey coast and inland. Uh, estuaries and such. Um, but it gets a little complicated. And this graph shows you some storms of the past, including uh, the 1821 hurricane. But here we've looked at the idea of the surge. So I've mentioned water level and I've mentioned surge. They're different. The surge is what would be added on to the, nor nor the high tide to be expected. Um, at a particular time. Um, it's not just the total water level. So you can see here, Gloria had a, a pretty impressive surge in 1985, not quite up to Sandy, but it came in at low tide at the battery in Southern Manhattan. So you didn't get as high a water level as Donna in 60, even though the storm surge was higher from Gloria. And you can see here also, this shows you it was high tide. You don't see the tidal influence. In fact, the tide brought it back down um, from Gloria. And this is um, sea level rise continuing to increase things. And this is uh, this is eustatic glacial uh, isostatic in uh, excuse me isostatic adjustment of the land surface from post glacial in post glacial times. But you can see Sandy won out for water level and surge height. Um, immediate impacts. Hoboken flooded. This is what the bridge there at 35 looked like in, in Maniloking before the storm. That's when the bay, the upper uh, Barnegat Bay met the ocean and just destroyed numerous homes and had to be stitched back together. Um, this is a bungalow community a little further down uh, the coast in, in Normandy Beach. This is what it looked like before the storm. It was obliterated by the storm surge and then subsequent fires from gas mains breaking. Um, just gone, never to, to return to date at least. It's being redeveloped differently. Um, this is an iconic shot along with that breach at Seaside Heights and that home on the Raritan Bay. Those are kind of three of the iconic shots from um, from Sandy, and you can see the uh, roller coaster out there off off the pier and in the water. 
Um, a student of mine foolishly rode out the storm in the southern end of, of Long Beach Island. This is what he and his buddy saw the next morning. Uh, they are fortunate the water only got up to about two feet deep in their one-story building, um, and uh, they, they survived, uh, thank goodness. Um, it wasn't all right at the coast. We can't forget the folks on the mainland who suffered tremendous flooding and were kind of forgotten, and I think still in some respects are still forgotten, from the surge that came into the bay and, and flooded homes along the mainland coast. Um, elsewhere, away from the coastlines, um, sometimes you had to go well away from the coastlines with the flooding, the surge flooding occurred, hundreds of thousands of trees down. Um, onto power lines, onto homes, onto cars, sadly in several cases resulting in the deaths of people in cars or outside their homes. Um, and we had the largest power outage in New Jersey history, over 80% of the state at one point losing power. Um, some areas, as we know, for multiple weeks. And with that, there were lines at gas stations. There are now more generators at gas stations to help keep them going should something like this occur again. Um, this taxi fleet didn't get out of harm's way. New Jersey Transit in the Meadowlands didn't get out of harm's way with a half billion dollars worth of train damage. Uh, the infrastructure was flooded. This is the PATH station in Hoboken taking on water. Um, we all remember um, the immediate impacts. And here, this map um, from the Times, a few months after the storm, tried to give a recap of the number of homes um, that were damaged or destroyed um, by, by the storm. So just how unusual was this storm? I think I've already made most of the claim to it. I threw this slide in to show you the general path storms take as they get into the middle Atlantic, and you can see most go from south to north or southwest to northeast. There's very few. There's your vagabond storm in 03 coming inland and going in this direction. Um, this was bef um, before we Sandy was put on here, but Sandy went out this way. Um, but the storm itself wasn't all that unusual for forming late in the season in the Western Caribbean. That's where you find late season storms form. And they tend to start coming up towards the coast, but they'll stay offshore or eventually take the westerlies out to sea. And again, as we mentioned earlier, this took a very unusual path because of the deep trough to the west and the blocking high to the north. Um, so that's Sandy. Now, to move forward and take a, a look at Ida with some of the same storm particulars, immediate impacts, uh, and the unusual nature of Ida. Um, this is some of the summary. Uh, came on September 1st, uh, 56 deaths um, in the mid-Atlantic. I've seen 30 and 32 deaths in New Jersey, but anyway, you look at it, it's the second deadliest natural disaster in New Jersey on record after Sandy. Most of these deaths in New Jersey were by drowning in and near car automobiles or in Elizabeth in, an, in a basement apartment complex and more deaths from drowning in apartment basement apartments in New York City uh, occurred. Um, damage in the tens of billions. Sandy had two, three times, maybe four times more damage, but still uh, a tens of billion dollars worth of damage. Uh, rainfall over nine inches at stations in Hillsborough and Flemington to the west of campus. We'll talk about recurrence intervals, but it was just remarkably unusual in terms of the intensity of rainfall in one, three, six hour increments. The type of rains that we saw in my earlier example up about Sparta and Hepatcon in 2000, that was a small area. Um, people may remember Henri just 10 days before Sandy um, flooded Helmeta in southern parts of uh, Middlesex and a little bit of southern Mercer County. Those are the kind of localized deluges that we see from time to time in the Mid-Atlantic. But this deluge wasn't just local. This area, to sum up, this is six-hour return intervals. And anything in the dark green to the next shade of green, all the way up from west of Philly into southern New England 
had 500 to 1,000 year recurrence intervals. In other words, a 0.5% chance to a 0.1% chance of occurring at a given spot in a given year. And look at the, the ground it covered. That was what was so unusual about this event was the area of coverage of these incredibly um, strong, heavy rains. In fact, the weather service could tell you right now how much rain would have to fall in the next six hours or three hours to have flash flood warnings in New Jersey. It's always out there. This one exceeded what they would consider um, criterion for a flash flood warning by 10 to 20 times. Um, thus, they issued a, a flash flood emergency in the midst of this uh, event. It was truly uh, an, uh, an unusual event. Frankly, in some respects, more unusual than Sandy, given the aerial coverage of that very quick hitting, devastating rain. And of course, those rains fell into rivers. And once again, we had flooding in the Raritan Basin and other areas in northern and central New Jersey um, that equaled uh, in the Raritan Basin, Floyd and Irene, three storms in the last 20, in 22 years that far surpassed any storm seen in the previous several hundred years. Um, this was Ida's track. It was a category five storm and made landfall and devastated Southern Louisiana. They're still really hurting down there, uh, particularly the indigenous populations. Um, as a category four hurricane, started diminishing in intensity, crossed over the, the Appalachians and ran into, if you will, a, a frontal system. And the two of them combined to this post-tropical cyclone um, that we still will call Ida, um, but it wasn't a tropical storm at that point, pulled moisture in off the Atlantic, pulled energy in along the frontal system. And, and that's what made it so devastating. Um, just to the north of the frontal system, it was cooler based on our network and the Delaware network. To the south, temperatures were 10 to 15 degrees warmer. And it was in this warmer quadrant of the storm that even went down to Annapolis, Maryland, where there were tornadoes. There was also a tornado in Camden County and one up in Mercer County, weaker than the major tornado that struck in Gloucester County. But that was in the warm sector where they didn't get the abundant rainfall that was seen further north. But that was the more turbulent area with shear in the atmosphere that led to this tornado. The first three, now they call them EF3 tornado in New Jersey since 1990, and only the fifth since 1950. Um, with winds, I can't remember off the top of my head, 130 miles an hour or thereabouts, that resulted in destruction to very strong. This was a, a, a pretty substantial home, a well-built home that was just shredded. Now, credit to the Weather Service for getting warnings out for tornadoes, credit to the population for he hearing those warnings and heeding those warnings, and there were no major injuries nor any deaths from this tornado down in South Jersey. Um, somebody say it was a miracle, but I think it was a combination of really good communication. Many a life was saved in North Jersey. We'll get to that in a moment. But tragically, the message didn't necessarily make it through. And that's in part because of the incredible amount of rain and the speed at which it fell. This area right here, had the equivalent of two months of rainfall in six hours. Up to the north, one month of rainfall in six hours. And to the south, very little rain fell down in the southeast part of the state. It was not a major event in the southeast, but anywhere north of here and down in the tornado area of South Jersey, Southwest Jersey, it was obviously an incredibly major event. This shows you the peak one hour rainfall, over three inches of rain in an hour in some areas in central into northeastern New Jersey. Again, average September rainfall is about four inches. This fell in one hour, three quarters of a month's rainfall. 
This is the end time of the, those stations in our weather network that recorded at least an inch and a half of rain in a given 12 five minute periods during that storm. And what's important about this, if you notice, the end time of the peak one hour rainfall was around 6 to 7, 8 p.m. in the western part of the state. It wasn't until 9 to 10 p.m. in the northeast part of the state. We saw that rain coming across the state and we're monitoring that three hour tour of that heavy rain across the state. And that no doubt being monitored by the Weather Service and emergency management and the media, I would like to think helped save lives, but it didn't save enough lives. And I don't think it got the attention if I may be totally self-serving that the Weather Network deserves. Although those data are fed every five minutes online to everyone and every five minutes directly into the National Weather Service's AWIPS forecasting system down in Mount Holly and out on Upton on Long Island, our two offices serving New Jersey. So a great partnership, don't get me wrong, a great partnership with the Weather Service and New Jersey emergency management officials, but and countless lives saved who were told stay out, stay home, a shelter in place if you're at a high enough location. Um, but everyone didn't catch it. And there, a month and a half in a three-hour period. Here are some of the three-hour precipitation totals. I won't dwell on this. I don't like tables uh, being shown too much, but you can see the recurrence intervals, thousand-year return intervals of three-hour precipitation in a handful of stations across the state. This shows the three-hour recurrence on a map. You've already seen the map for the six-hour recurrence. So this, the state was just pounded hour after hour for six hours as that storm moved across the, any portion of the state. With that, of course, came flash flooding. This is a stream near the Hillsborough Station at Duke Farms, which received the most precip. It went up from under two feet to 14 feet. It rose, the water level rose over 12 feet in a very short period of time, just a couple hours. What I, we did here was plot the increase in rainfall at the Duke, Hillsborough Duke Station and the increase in the water level in that stream over time that evening. And you can see there was about a one hour lead time of the heaviest rain versus when the river, when the, the, the brook went up, uh, when Rice Brook went up. You know, we've got to pay attention to this in the future to get roads closed, to do localized, really hyper-local emergency warnings to stay off the roads because there were people drowned on the roads near this location in areas I've ventured in for 30 plus years and I'm still amazed that there were drownings on those roads. Um, so we had a little bit of lead time, but this is a small a catchment basin, which floods, flash floods real quickly. This is the Stony Brook that feeds into the Millstone, our Hopewell Township Station out at the Watershed Institute. And you can see the rainfall there, and you can see that stream go up, the Stony Brook go up with a multi-hour lead time. Uh, we looked at it for the Elizabeth River. In Elizabeth, there was about a two, two and a half hour lead time. So we've got to work better to get this information out to people, um, get it to the emergency officials, um, have them get out the warnings. People need to hear those warnings and they have to know what to do when they hear those warnings. Uh, of course, that's the flash flooding where the deadliest, uh, where the deaths occurred. It was followed the next day by river flooding. And, and this shows the Raritan River just north of Duke Estate back here, normally here, but flooding a large area of Raritan. Um, this is the gauge just downstream from Raritan at, on, on the Raritan in Manville. It surpassed Floyd and Irene. Uh, along the river there, it was a toss up between the three of those events. Um, Sometimes I call this a double whammy. Petersbrook in Somerville in Somerset County, this is the flash flooding of the night of the storm. Then the flash flooding went down, but the Raritan River went up 
and pushed water upstream and wouldn't let subsequent runoff come downstream. And it flooded the area again, caught a Somerville fire truck in the second flood crest. But there they got the flash flooding and the river flooding with just that short break in between. Um, here are the flooding impacts. There you can see in Elizabeth from the flash flooding in Manville. Again, the flooding in the Lost Valley section of Manville. Um, explosions and fire always occur. There was a, a fire up in Nome, Alaska from the flooding that occurred just the other day. We saw explosions of several houses in Manville. This was a catering hall in Manville that went up in the midst of the floodwaters. Um, the damage, this, this was downtown Manville um, several days after the storm, a few hours after President Biden visited the town to survey the damage. Um, I want to throw this up before we get to some closing slides. Um, this is, again, the rainfall, but this is a map that was put together by NJ Spotlight after the storm. These green dots represent where deaths occurred, multiple deaths with the larger dots. And you notice that the deaths from that storm in New Jersey were right along the line of the 500 to 1,000 year recurrence flooding. It was They were not to the north where a month's worth of rain fell in the evening or of course to the south, and thank goodness not where the tornado struck. They were right where this heaviest rain fell. So there's obviously a very strong correlation uh, between that. So let's now look at storms in a broader sense. Um, New Jersey's climate's changing. The top graph shows that precipitation is increasing in the last 40 years or so in New Jersey. This is a linear regression starting in 1980, about the time when we as climatologists are confident we begin to see a, a human-induced climate change signal emerge from a very noisy climate system. That's the drought of the 1960s. That's annual rainfall, 1895 to 2021. You can see We've had the two wettest years in 127 years in 2011, thanks in part to Irene, and 2018, just because we had a lot of rainstorms. We didn't have a major rainstorm that year. We just had a lot of rainstorms, but we can still have some dry years. So we have to be prepared for all, all comers uh, when it comes, particularly in recent decades, a lot of interannual variability. Now we segue down to temperature. Yeah, New Jersey's getting warmer. Um, you know, we just went through uh, the third warmest summer on record, and eight of the 10 warmest summers on record in New Jersey have been since, since 2005. Remember, we're looking at records back to 1895. So this is annual temperatures in New Jersey rising. So you've got higher temperatures. With that, a more turbulent weather patterns, stormier weather patterns, where there's a physical relationship that warmer atmosphere has the potential of holding more moisture. So when a storm hits, a trigger comes, it can release more moisture. And we're seeing that in the weather records. We've had an increase in extreme rainfall in recent decades in two inch plus rainfall events. Doesn't mean every rainfall event occurs and it doesn't mean we still don't have drought. This summer, we had the warmth we had some humidity in the air, but we didn't have the triggers come along, a tropical system come along, a lot of powerful frontal systems come along to generate anything but very localized storms for the most part. Uh, so it's not going to happen every year and all the time, but overall we're seeing the adage when it rains, it pours. And we've begun to see recurrent flooding, which just doesn't seem to be a coincidence. These are extremes, so they're unusual. So you have to have some patience as a climatologist. But here we have Floyd in South Manville, a nor'easter, another nor'easter, Irene, and a couple storms I didn't get my camera out to get. Um, I live on the other side of the river now. I couldn't get over there to look at Ida. And I had to get to campus to teach at the end of the semester in 2014 to catch it. But as six of the eight largest floods in the lower millstone, from, as measured at Blackwell's Mills, in the last century, six of the eight top floods of the last century have occurred since Floyd 
in 1999. And this is not due to development upstream. Yes, there has been some, and it contributes particularly to the flash flooding aspects of storms, but it's simply too much rain in too short a period of time over a large or full portion of the basin. Uh, and we're seeing this time and again. So I believe we are beginning to see evidence of extremes really starting to um, uh, be quite present. So what does that mean for the future? Temperatures are going to continue to rise in New Jersey. We're quite confident of that. Uh, the climate models suggest steady or increasing precipitation in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, with more energy, warmer oceans, warmer atmosphere, more moisture in the atmosphere, and so on, increasing variability and extremes. Storms, when the trigger's there, floods when the trigger's there. When the triggers aren't there, the increased heat dries out the surface and can turn off the rain-making process. And you can go from flood to drought to flood pretty quickly. And then, of course, the increased heat and all of this with an ongoing foundational level of our oceans rising and rising, making in the future your typical storm more impactful along the coast equivalent to your stronger storms of the past. Temperatures, we don't know exactly how far they're going to rise because we simply don't know how we're going to control our pollutants into the atmosphere, our greenhouse gases. We're going to go greener, we'll lower the increase in temperature. We let the system run as, as present. Um, it will increase the temperatures further as we go into the latter part of this century and into the next century. Um, mean annual precipitation is five to 8% higher in recent decades than the end of the century. We uh, will be higher than what we've seen back up. It will be higher than what we've seen in the beginning of this century by five to 8% by the end of the century with a moderate to high emission scenario. We reduce emissions, we can reduce that percentage. Um, longer dry spells between rainfall events, particularly in the summer. Is this summer particularly caused by this? Perhaps, but it's certainly illustrative of that. And that's gonna affect our water supplies and such. Um, we've seen increased rainfall today's 100 year 24 hour event though down the road, models suggest will be a 50 year event. It's not like suddenly we're gonna get 100 year events every year or even every decade, but they're gonna become more common. Uh, tropical cyclones, there's evidence that they could become stronger. I think especially because sea surface temperatures are gonna be warmer along the coast. Not necessarily more of them, but stronger as they come up the coast. There's evidence that these storms are spinning up more quickly, which if that's near the coast, that could give you less warning time. And there are some recent studies that suggest they're keeping their strength for a longer period of time as they advance inland. So not necessarily more storms, but yes, potentially worse storms. And then, you know, this isn't fantasy here. There are worst case scenarios. You could get a storm situation with an incredibly powerful storm category two or three storm, paralleling the Jersey coast, giving us devastating rains on the west or left side of the storm and being close enough to us and strong enough that while the sea and Long Island gets absolutely clobbered by the winds, still strong enough to give us winds that would exceed the strength of Sandy's winds and push water into New York Harbor and, and up along the Jersey coast and into the bays. So it would have essentially Floyd's precipitation, Irene's precipitation. I didn't put Ida in here um, because it wasn't a coastal um, hurricane and Sandy's winds are worse than that. And remember, it's gonna be, they'll be occurring on a higher base level as sea level rises. So it paints a worrisome scenario along the coast again, Nothing predicted today, tomorrow, next decade, when it's going to happen. But I think we should certainly be prepared for the extreme event of today and tomorrow and the longer term change of these events uh, in the future. So we can expect more storms. We're primed for more storms. I just leave you with two questions. 
as New Jersey becomes smarter than the storm. We saw stronger than the storm t-shirts after Sandy, but have we become smarter than the storm? And, and can it become even more so? Can those spark, smarts, I should have said, become even greater? And I think that can occur, greater predictability, greater monitoring, um, greater um, warnings, better communication than ever before for people to hear the warnings and better education so that people will know how to heed those warnings. Put that whole package together. We will become smarter and smarter as we deal with these future storms. With that, a tranquil picture of the confluence of the Millstone <laughs> and Raritan just to temper things down a bit. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Good, good job ending on a nice, calm, peaceful looking slide. <laughs> um, I'm going to start the poll uh, for everyone um, as we go through some of the questions. Dave, I'm going to give you a heads up. There are a lot of questions <laughs> that people have. I'm ready. They figured they, they have the state climatologist uh, um, over the coals, so they might as well ask him some questions, which I'll get to in a second. But I will start the poll. So if you see it on your screen, please fill it out as we go through some of the questions uh, for Dr. Robinson. Um, Dave, first and foremost, um, Sandy's been categorized as a superstorm versus calling it a hurricane. So why is it called a superstorm, and how is that different than calling it a hurricane? Yeah, well, you know, when it comes to making landfall in New Jersey as I, and, and up and down the East Coast, it was not a hurricane upon landfall. I mean, it could be split in differences and all. It was a hurricane until just several hours before making landfall. But essentially, when it made landfall, it was a dying hurricane with kind of a nor'easter, if you will, wrapped around it. So it was this hybrid storm. And I think the media, I don't know who coined, you can probably search it out somewhere, who coined the term superstorm. But we've had other superstorms. But it just kind of took on the name Superstorm Sandy. Theoretically, it, it wasn't Hurricane Sandy. It wasn't Tropical Storm Sandy. Um, so do you want to say post-tropical cyclone Sandy? Um, <laughs> probably. I, I have no problem. I, I have friends who, you know, amateur meteorologists, enthusiasts who take umbrage with calling it superstorm because there is no strict definition of superstorm. I'm OK with that. If that what brings it to people's attention, so be. Well, thank you for being okay with it because that's what we called it in the flyer for the. <laughs> um, a few questions um, that people asked were basically about the infrastructure and what needs to be done to to help that. Somebody mentioned that in Florida, um, they're putting in electrical grid towers to replace their telephone poles. And do, are there any plans for New Jersey to do something like that? And then secondarily for the infra infrastructure, what are the plans for increased radio communication? Because with electricity going out, you know, you're not going to get TV. Yeah. So what are some of the things that are being, being done on the infrastructure side of it? Yeah, I'll address those questions, but with the caveat that I'm not an expert on the infrastructure side of things. And I think you're going to see people who maybe hold those questions to ask again in, in the, the rest of the series. Um, there's been talk of burying um, electrical lines around the state, which would be incredibly expensive, hardening the infrastructure to withstand the winds better. And that's certainly, we know where the winds are stronger, uh, are destined to be stronger in open areas, hillsides near the coast, for instance. So there's, again, more experience gained, lessons learned on where we can harden the infrastructure. Along the coast, yeah, there are seawalls, there's bulkheads that can be built up, there's other, uh, there's dunes that can be, that was a, a key word from the governor at the time. My favorite word he said after that storm was dune, but that in involves keeping the water from the ocean coming ashore. But as many of you know, the major flooding often comes, most often comes from the bay back onto these coastal um, uh, barrier islands and barrier peninsulas. So that won't solve everything. Um, and then there's natural uh, defenses, um, the grasslands along the coast and build them up and they can serve as a bit of a buffer, these soft natural um, protection mechanisms. But frankly, all of these 
get overwhelmed when you get to a storm surge and water levels the type of sandy. It's almost like they're curbs rather than walls. So you're building up your infrastructure to handle more and more storms, but how much can you invest to stop the strongest of the storms from coming inland? That's a decision I leave to the planners, the politicians, the voting public, um, and the economists. Um, but you know, there's certain category of storm that no matter what you do, Ida, for instance, you've just got to close the roads. Um, and where you see repetitive flooding, you know, get more Blue Acre funds to get people out of these poor people that have been impacted time and again. And there have been some programs inland, but no one's bought into this Blue Acres right along the coast because it's it's so valuable. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our culture or whatever it might be. So there we are. Um, I will let people know, we do have a couple of questions that are um, asking about um, coastal areas and what can be done specifically for coastal areas. I will just throw out the reminder that next week uh, on the 26th, we have Dr. Tom Harrington from Monmouth University's Urban Coast Institute. He's gonna talk about coastal resiliency and community planning. And we also have on October 24th, um, Dr. John Miller from Stevens Institute of Technology, who's gonna be talking about um, beach nourishment and, and living shorelines. And he'll talk about some of the dune systems that, that Dave mentioned as well. So if we don't get to your question tonight, please join us on those dates and ask those people, put them on the hot seat for us. I defer to them. I've known them both for years. Tom used to be up at Stevens before he went down to Monmouth University. They're both top-notch guys. They know New York Harbor. They know the Jersey coast uh, intimately. So I recommend both of them highly. Um, so. I'm sorry if it feels like I'm jumping around, but I'm trying to get through some of the questions. But um, somebody had a question about predicting um, storms. Um, they mentioned that you know you showed great coverage of the precipitation and 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 weather stations that we have throughout New Jersey, and especially since we're trying to work towards climate change predictions through 2030. Um, is there um, what are your thoughts on predicting the storm risk from using that kind of local scale precipitation based modeling versus kind of next generation physics driven modeling that's a little bit more re regional or global? Um, all the above. I mean, we need to have the local and that's why we have mesonets. That's why the majority of the funding for the New Jersey, the Rutgers New Jersey Weather Network is from the National Weather Service, where the data not only go to the local forecast offices, they go nationally and there are other national mesonet, states with mesonets. I mentioned Delaware, Pennsylvania is developing one. New, Jer New York got $100 million from Sandy money to build a new network. Uh, our office got zero. I might add, partially it got zero because we were already there and we only lost one anemometer map mount of 50 stations we had in at the time. It was a tremendous success story, but it was probably too darn successful. Um, but anyway, um, you need these nested models, um, but our data will help make Find, and the data from other mesonets and other sources of local data make for a better forecast. But you, uh, uh, when I say nested, you have the larger scale models and then you bring it into a more local area as you identify the hot spots that are, are, are threatened. So it really takes uh, a multiple iteration of models. One model's not going to do it. One size model won't do it. So that's the way the modeling communities are going. And you're starting to get artificial intelligence brought into some of this modeling and more faster computers, more data. But these forecast models are only as good as the data that goes into them. And I'm not being totally self-serving as an observational scientist here. And I'm talking satellite data, um, balloons in the atmosphere. There's talk of putting drones up into the atmosphere instead of just balloons. Um, we have profilers, uh, one near campus, and uh, the New York Network has a bunch of those, um, and, and ground-based system. All of that information has to be efficiently put into these forecast models because they spin up based on those observations, um, a little bit different than the way these long-term climate models are, are driven. Um, so um, again, I, it may sound like I'm dodging 
which models the best to use. But the fact is, there isn't a single best model to use. Um, uh, bef before I go into the questions, let me just ask you first: Are are you familiar with what's happening down in Puerto Rico in the Dominican Republic? Some people you know, absolutely some talked about it in class today, <laughs> along with the Alaskan storm and the typhoon that hit Japan uh, <laughs> late last week and over the weekend. It, it's pretty darn active um, storms out, out there. Um, you know that storm did not have the wind field of Maria five years ago tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Um, but it had very strong winds um, and it had, I think we'll find more precipitation. Um, it took a track just below the island and the precipitation shield kind of came behind the storm as it developed from a tropical storm to a hurricane. And they're measuring rain in multiple feet in some areas of Puerto Rico and the winds were at hurricane force. And you know they've again, um, decimated the electric grid in the state, in the territory. And, and just, I've seen videos of bridges being washed out and such. So they're in a real sorry state. This storm, um, the last I looked at, I didn't have much time this afternoon to look at anything, but is destined probably to hook up between there and, and um, the Dominican Republic and head up into the North Atlantic far enough offshore to only give us swells, but watch it. I'm kind of glad it's going to be cold later in the week because it will keep people out of the ocean um, because it's going to get rough and there's no lifeguards out there now. It may actually hit Nova Scotia or Newfoundland come the end of the week as it heads north out to sea. There's no block in the north to push it towards our coastline. So East coast of the U.S., certainly the Gulf states have dodged um, this storm in what's been a very quiet year. But as I always say, and they sure know it tonight in Puerto Rico, it only takes one. It only takes one. Um, someone was curious as to whether or not uh, Fiona, the one that hit Puerto Rico. Yeah, it's Fiona. Yeah, if, if it exceeded the forecast for intensity and, 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 and wind speed. Um. Yeah, I'm going to have to look back into that. I know they thought it was going to become a hurricane. I think it became a hurricane a little faster than expected. I'm not so sure if they didn't think it would be a little bit by Puerto Rico before it attained hurricane status. Um, but that's a little outside of my realm. I'll leave it to, to my meteorolo meteorology colleagues who might have some thoughts on that. Um, but again, it's not a particularly powerful storm but if you get the right ingredients and that storm takes the right or wrong path, you're going to take a, a very hard hit. And, and Puerto Rico was absolutely in the wrong location for this storm. Mm -hmm. And that's the best I know about it right now without, you know, we'll know a little bit more as the... Uh, um, we get more reports in. But one thing I can say for sure, from Kokoraz data reports I've seen from this storm of 15, 16 inches of rain in a large swaths. And I don't think that begins to tell the whole story. And we did put in the chat for folks the link to the Kokoraz website if they wanted to join that and, and be able to do that as well. Great. That's so great. in terms of uh, predicting these types of storms, somebody was curious as to some of the tools that you use. So in addition to the, the, the weather stations that you have, um, are you or someone else possibly at Rutgers using any sort of underwater drones or other kind of devices to track and predict these kind of weather system changes? I, I, absolutely. And, and this is for a future series. And I know there have been other lectures beforehand, but the cool room uh, with S Scott Glenn and others um, in our marine um, uh, department, they've done incredibly interesting work with um, these um, offshore drones of sort that go underwater they go at different levels underwater they measure water temperatures and such and and they they've taken a good look at water sh off the, the jersey shore and the mid atlantic and found correlations between storm strength and the water temperatures i i don't want to embarrass myself by misstating some specifics here but definitely look into the work they've done this is a real 
I mean, Rutgers has led the way with this and it's becoming ubiquitous in terms of monitoring. And they even, there are groups out there now that have sail, these like surfboards on sails going into these storms. But when it comes to these, um, these um, dolphins, I often think of when I see it, that have been uh, developed at Rutgers and all, um, Rutgers can be very proud to be a leader there. And we're learning more about the thermal profiles of the ocean and how that may correlate with storm strength. Yeah, they've been doing some really impressive work, especially in, in terms of like fish modeling and behavior and stuff. Oh yeah, there's a lot more to them. They have all these fabulously interesting instruments on them now to measure water, ocean chemistry and track marines associated with wind, offshore wind projects and, and so on and so forth. Um, do you have time for a couple more questions? Oh yeah. All right. I'm not so, that hungry yet. <laughs> so with all the storms that you mentioned in New Jersey, someone wanted to, to know, has there been um, someone looking at the amount of developed area in relationship to those storm events and the amount of flooding and any sort of the adverse impacts that have happened? There, there's been some. Certainly you look at, and again, I'll turn to our Chris, our, our, um, our, our remote sensing center, Center for Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis, um, led by uh, Professor Lathrop, and they've really modeled impervious surfaces in the state. Um, there hasn't been enough connection, I think. I think there's work to be done still in trying to look at that. As I mentioned in the presentation, there's no question the amount of impervious surface is related very closely to flash flooding. Um, but when it comes to these major systems, I don't care if it's a field or a forest or a parking lot or a rooftop. You put six inches of rain on an area in a couple of hours, nothing's going to soak in anywhere and it's going to run off. Um, so these major broad basin events um, aren't as, imp as impacted as much by the type of surface cover as the localized flash flooding uh, can be. But this is definitely something that could be better modeled. And there are people interested in that at Rutgers and elsewhere um, who should be given support and encouragement to continue such modeling. We'll provide the precipitation information. We'd love to work with them um, with their expertise on modeling, landscape modeling. Um, just a reminder that the poll is still open for those of you who would like to um, answer the questions in that. That would be fantastic if you'd be able to do that. So basically, um, I, I have one, <laughs> one last question that's got multiple parts to it. <laughs> and okay. the, the, the basic overall question is, what can be done about these kind of events? And the multiple parts are people are looking for an individual basis. Somebody asked about environmental groups and doing stream bank restorations. And someone else asked about um, engineers and developers and what they're doing to um, deal with like detention basins and how are they preparing for future events. So what can be done, I guess, is basically on those kind of yeah. levels, an individual level, an organization level, and a community kind of level. Yeah, again, I preface by saying you're going to hear a lot more about this, I think, in the next five <laughs> presentations in one area of the state or another. Um, because it covers so much. You mentioned personal activities, group activities, engineers getting involved, and it, it is all the above. Um, you know, there are ways we can come up with some engineering fixes, hard or soft, if you will, in terms of engineering. Um, again, it's the, it's the magnitude of the storm we're trying to protect against today and what may come dec multiple decades down the road. I like to think, we, we, it, there's a nexus between these extreme weather events and long-term climate and climate change because we can build one um, for the other and they work together. So we can't look at them as separate entities. There's some engineering fixes. Um, we can do um, development and policies, turn to the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. We can avoid um, development, further development in flood prone areas. We have to look to the scientists and, and DEP, which has gotten some recent reports that suggest that we may need to change um, flood zones with these increasing heavy rain events inland 
and rising sea level and potentially stronger storms along the coast. So there's planning and public policy that plays a role there. Um, there's individuals, you know, we have to be smart when we look where to live to, to avoid places or building in spots or living in spots that are vulnerable. And then what it comes down to, and this is the one I keep drumming home, I learned a lot from the social scientists working with them after Sandy, social scientists at Rutgers and elsewhere. And that's the whole idea of messaging, um, getting the message out there and you know, not to drum you to numbness, but it's a matter of getting the good forecast, getting it out to people, getting people to hear it and getting people who are educated in knowing what to do and, oh yeah, doing what they're supposed to do. And that's, that's when it comes to saving lives. We can rebuild properties. We can't rebuild lives, if you will. Um, and not to get melodramatic, that, that's the case. Um, I hate the fact that we suffered these deaths. I'm grateful for the fact that they weren't worse, um, but um, we, we can do better. And if we don't learn from the past events, the Sandys and now the Idas, we're destined to repeat mistakes we've made individually or collectively in the future. So there, there's my preachiness, um, but we have to approach it in a lot of different directions. And I will say, just as a minor plug for the Earth Day Everyday program, if you go to our website, we have done previous talks that are recorded on adapting to coastal flooding, how to deal with stormwater issues with rain gardens and reducing impervious cover and stuff. So please go through our, our, our previous library of recorded um, webinars to see if there's anything of interest that you might be able to get some information on to okay. kind of... Um, get 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 more detail on these things yeah, um, that's and great I, and, and and notice steve i was talking about storms and extreme events mm -hmm. but we could talk climate change another time and talk about uh a mitigative activities mm -hmm. uh that dovetail in some cases with adaptive approaches that we need for these extreme storms as well as climate change mm -hmm. but we didn't talk about greener infrastructure mm -hmm. uh greener energy and such that's mm -hmm kind of wasn't the focus of tonight. So mm -hmm. I stuck more to what we can do to deal with these extreme weather events, these extreme storms. Yeah, and, and we do understand that what we asked you to talk about tonight is an entire semester's long <laughs> <laughs> class semester. uh, to, con to condense it down. Um, it's, a whole, it's, a, it's a whole um, uh, degree, actually. <laughs> it's not just one semester. Um, it but is, I will say, but... Amy did put the link to those recordings in the, in the chat. Yeah, and, and remember, you don't. We don't all. We're, we all have our specialties. We don't have to be experts on everything, but you know what I stress, and it's the professor in me, is we come to some understanding, and with that understanding, we'll be better informed to make the decisions and, and to move forward individually and collectively. Um, so you know, learning, understanding, can't say enough. I don't know of a better way to end on, on than on that note, Dave. Thank you so much for, for your time and for answering the questions tonight. And thank you to everybody who joined us. Really appreciate it, Dave, for a great webinar. Um, a lot of feedback from people saying how fantastic it was and how great the information was. But thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity.